The year was 1965 when Singapore was left for dead. Forced out by Malaysia due to political and economic differences between the ruling parties, Singapore gained independence against its own will, facing a rapidly growing population and a pressing need to build economic strength. Singapore was devoid of natural resources and needed more land for residential, commercial, and industrial uses. It was a race against time. But how are they going to solve the land shortage problem to guarantee their survival? Land reclamation was the answer but it wasn't always that straightforward. Stay with me to find out more. So what is land reclamation? To put it simply, it is the process of creating new land from the sea. Since gaining independence, Singapore has undertaken extensive land reclamation projects to increase its land size by approximately 25%, and reach a land mass of 733 square kilometers today. Singapore will need at least another 5,600 hectares of land to accommodate the projected increase of population to 6.9 million by 2030. However, land reclamation in Singapore had already started in the colonial days, long before it gained independence. In 1822, the first land reclamation project was done on the south bank of the Singapore River, as the south bank had a low-lying marsh which made it prone to flooding. Laborers had to dig earth from a hill to fill the wetlands. An embankment was created by the edge of the river so that it would not overflow onto the land. Today, this area is known as Boat Quay. While the place where the hill once stood is now Raffles Place, the center of Singapore's financial district. Other land reclamation projects in areas such as Telok Aye and Beach Road added a total of 300 hectares of land during the colonial period. Although this was no mean feat given the limited technology at that time, the reclamation projects that took place post-independence were even more impressive. Land reclamation kick-started in 1966 at Marine Parade to house a growing nation that just gained independence. This was the first part of a multi-phase mega-project on the east coast of Singapore. Hills around Singapore were leveled by excavators, and the earth was transported to the coastline via conveyor belts and barges for reclamation. Instead of using traditional seawalls to protect the newly reclaimed land from erosion, Singapore was one of the first countries in the world to deploy artificial headland breakwaters on an extensive scale. The breakwaters were positioned along the coastline and acted as natural bays, nullifying the wave action. A total of 405 hectares of land was reclaimed and the first public housing blocks were built on it in 1972. This gave Marine Parade the distinction of being the world's first housing estate to be wholly built on reclaimed land. Over the next two decades, the project added 1525 hectares of land to the coastline, which included a beachfront for recreation. Today, Marine Parade is one of the most sought-after residential districts because of its gorgeous seafront and commercial facilities. To support economic growth, Singapore made the strategic decision to court foreign investments by promoting its manufacturing sector. This meant that even more land was needed for industrial estates. Between the early 1960s to mid-1980s, close to 2,700 hectares of land were reclaimed from crocodile-infested swamps in Jurong, followed by Tuas, to support Singapore's industrialization efforts. However, it soon became clear that reclaiming land near the mainland was not going to be enough to further expand its industries. And so Singapore audaciously created a man-made island by joining several offshore islands located southwest of it through reclamation works. The islands, which were approximately 990 hectares, were amalgamated into a massive island of 3,000 hectares and is now known as Jurong Island. The project was completed in 2009 and is currently home to an integrated chemical hub for some of the biggest petrochemical companies such as ExxonMobil and Shell. In the early 1970s, Singapore took on yet another ambitious land reclamation project in the Marina Bay area to support the inevitable expansion of the city centre. By the late 1990s, 360 hectares of prime land were made available in the Marina Bay area for development. Today, the expansion plans that Singapore put in place decades ago have come to fruition. The Marina Bay area is now the new downtown comprising commercial developments, high-rise offices, and luxury condominiums, all set against the backdrop of a beautiful waterfront. Marina Bay sands and gardens by the bay are also prominent landmarks found in Marina Bay. But this aggressive expansion of its borders has led to tensions between Singapore and its neighbors. The ugly truth will be revealed next. But before that, if you would like to see more videos from the channel, remember to subscribe and hit the notification button. By now, you would probably have figured that to reclaim land, materials are required to fill the seabed. 
the materials usually come from soil dug from inland hills, and sand from the surrounding seabed. However, by the mid-1980s, Singapore encountered a major problem. The materials were beginning to deplete because there were only that many hills that could be excavated, and sand sourced locally was running out. To address this issue, Singapore started to import massive amounts of sand from neighboring countries. Over the years, Singapore's need for sand has risen tremendously, propelling the country to become the largest sand importer in the world. It is estimated that Singapore had imported at least 517 million tons of sand over the last two decades. After water, sand is the next largest resource used by the world. Besides land reclamation, sand is used in most construction projects, resulting in an exponential rise in demand for this precious commodity. And with annual world consumption of sand at 50 billion tons, sand is depleting at an alarming rate. This has been made worse by the illegal trading of sand as sand mining and trading were not well regulated internationally. Sand also plays several key roles in the environment such as providing a healthy habitat to various species, and protecting against erosion. So it comes as no surprise that serious environmental concerns have been raised at the international level. As Singapore expands, its neighbors are shrinking because their territories such as islands and beaches are being demolished to provide sand for Singapore's land reclamation. Singapore has always maintained good international relations, especially with its Southeast Asian neighbors but sand was proving to be a catalyst for diplomatic conflicts. It was even alleged that Singapore had smuggled sand to feed its hunger for land. Alas, Singapore's enormous appetite for sand led to several countries banning the export of the commodity to the nation. In 2007, Indonesia banned sand export to Singapore citing concerns that the extensive extraction of sand was degrading the environment. Rampant sand extraction activities, which are not well regulated, had already destroyed several islands and were threatening the existence of 80 other small Indonesian islands that were near the Singapore borders. It was also rumored that Indonesia was using sand as leverage to force Singapore into signing an extradition treaty as several Indonesian businessmen had fled to Singapore to escape persecution for corruption. But this is a story for another day. Cambodia imposed a similar ban in 2017, on grounds that large-scale sand mining was damaging the local ecosystem. It was reported that Cambodia had lost several beaches due to excessive sand dredging. The natural habitat for crabs and fishes was destroyed by sand extraction which resulted in the decline of their population. As a result, the livelihoods of the local fishing communities were severely impacted with many locals falling into poverty. There was also suspicion of sand smuggling when the United Nations reported that Singapore had imported at least 72 million tons of sand from Cambodia, which was significantly lesser than the 3 million tons of sand exports that the Cambodian government had on record. Most recently in 2019, Malaysia enacted a ban on sand export to Singapore. Malaysia had imposed the ban amidst concerns that biodiversity and hydrological conditions of the water bodies were adversely affected by sand mining. The ban also intended to stop the illegal smuggling of sand to Singapore facilitated by corrupt Malaysian officials. However, it was widely reported that Malaysia had a hidden agenda. The ban was meant to curb the expansion of its successful neighbor especially when Malaysia had accounted for 97% of Singapore's total sand imports in 2018. Interestingly, back in 2003, Malaysia had taken Singapore to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea to stop its land reclamation projects near Malaysia's territorial waters. Malaysia was concerned that the reclamation works were harming its maritime environment as it made navigation challenging and fishermen's livelihoods were affected. The issue was resolved after international experts confirmed that there was no major environmental concerns. Today, Singapore continues to import sand from other countries such as India, Myanmar, and the Philippines while building up a stockpile of sand for emergency uses. The government has also taken steps to reduce its reliance on sand for land reclamation. In fact, Singapore has emulated the Dutch and adopted the empoldering method to reclaim land for the first time. Unlike the traditional approach of sand infilling, the empoldering concept entails building a dike that measures 10 kilometers long and stands 6 meters above sea level. It is used to first block off water from the area that needed to be reclaimed. Drainage canals and water pumping systems are then used to control the water levels within the area, creating a low-lying stretch of land called a polder. Empoldering significantly reduces the volume of sand required for land reclamation. Using this method, 810 hectares of land will be reclaimed at Pulau Tekong, a small island used for Singapore's military training. This project is expected to complete by end of 2024. 
Land reclamation is unsustainable in the long term given the global shortage of sand supply and its destructive impact on the environment. With this in mind, Singapore has been exploring innovative ways to maximize the use of underground space. To free up valuable surface land for purposes such as housing and community spaces. Transportation and utility infrastructures, retail and pedestrian linkways are already located underground. In 2014, Singapore opened the Jurong Rock Caverns, Southeast Asia's very first commercial underground oil storage facility. This enabled 60 hectares worth of usable surface land to be freed up. Not one to rest on its laurels, Singapore is already studying other possibilities of underground space usage, such as urban agriculture, light industry factories, and data centers. To address the land shortage, Singapore is also looking to build floating structures on the surrounding water bodies. Following the construction of floating solar farms in its reservoirs, Singapore is now piloting a new floating solar panel system that will be placed at sea, close to Jurong Island. A Singapore startup, called Floating On, recently announced that they would be developing floating properties to offer affordable and sustainable accommodation. These homes are built modularly at a relatively lower cost, have an efficient water management system, and are powered by solar energy. The properties are slated to be launched in 2023. Studies are also underway to determine the feasibility of building floating bridges and oil storage facilities. With Singapore's relentless pursuit of land, it would not be surprising if some of these innovative ideas bear fruit in the near future. Undoubtedly, land-scarce Singapore will press on with land reclamation in the foreseeable future to meet its economic and population demands. Yet, it is acutely aware that more sustainable alternatives are required given that its aggressive land reclamation projects are not tenable in the long term. But how does Singapore protect its lands from the larger countries that surround it? Check out this video on how insanely militarized is Singapore. And if you are keen to watch more videos, do check out the links in the description below. See you at the next one.